Hello and welcome back to another 5K tennis discussion. Uh, today is, oh my gosh, I forgot what the date was. March 14th. March 14th. 2020. Let's go. All right, hopefully everyone is well. Uh, we all know why a lot of us are kind of, I guess you could say, hanging out close to home and not moving around a lot. Um, so what we wanted to do today is actually take a step away um, from talking about what everyone on the globe is talking about. And we won't even say it. Actually, we, we like to say it, but we've been kind of told in messages, uh, at least from um, the platform, YouTube, that you know only certain see us, see us. O only certain people are allowed to kind of be you know yeah. to talk about this, and we're not one of those. So, but in all actually, in all actuality, it's probably a good thing because everyone um, knows what we're talking about first and foremost. Uh, obviously, hopefully, everyone is safe. Furthermore, over the past 24 hours, I, I know Carla, um, uh, you and I have talked with people all across the globe from Spain, Serbia, Italy, uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, Sweden, uh, South Africa, Holland. Sweden, uh, on personal levels. Uh, some, of, some of you communicate with, uh, I know Carla and I on Facebook Messenger and some other things, but um, it's been really a blessing to, to get to know you guys. I, I know on a personal level, aside from just talking about tennis, but I think it was Carla this morning. I think we left here at about four thirty, five o'clock this morning. Carla and I, we have a couple of different hustles that we do. Um, um, we coach, but in the mornings on Saturdays, we get up really early and go to garage sales. I don't know if you all know what garage sales are, at least uh, afar. But garage sales are, are like a moving sale. You know, if you're moving or going somewhere and you're just trying to get rid of your stuff, you know, you kind of sell it in your driveway or in your yard. And anyway, so we frequent those and then we try to resell what, what we, we, we purchase. But I, I, I know that today you were speaking with a young lady. I think her name was Marie. Marie, yeah. In Spain, I think, um, for about three or four hours. I mean, not consistently, but, you know, here and there for over three or four hours dealing with uh, the situation there. So welcome, Marie. It was really fun. Uh, well, I wasn't talking yeah, with Marie you. Yeah, Marie Aldridge. Aldridge, Liz yeah. on the Spanish Costa. Coast. So, so we, uh, again, uh, the, the whole point of doing this is, is to, to build a, a, a group of um, tennis family in a way that, that we can talk tennis with and, and objectively and compete sometimes and maybe not agree sometimes, but ultimately to get together and shake hands at the net so uh, we love all of you, and it's really been a great time here the past, especially, especially the past couple of days with all this stuff going on. Um, but Carla and I, we got back from doing that today, and Carla and I spent uh, the latter uh, part of the afternoon um, doing our normal thing, and that's coaching lessons. Uh, we got off of the court, I think around 4.30, 5 o'clock, and we proceeded back here to, to the house. And we both came across an article uh, and the article we read, I'm not going to cite the article because we're not reading the article, but the article was related to uh, Rafael Nadal's uncle, uh, who is Uncle Tony, Tony Nadal, who was his lifelong coach, I think, until, you know, relatively recently, where I think Uncle Tony, uh, or Tony Nadal, I say Uncle Tony's like, he's my uncle. <laughs> I guess everybody calls him Uncle Tony. Hey, Uncle Tony, what's up, man? What's up, Uncle Tony? Tony Nadal. Uh, but anyway. Tony Nadal. I, th I think they separated in a sense because uh, Tony Nadal has always meant business as a coach, like on, in your face, hard, tough coach. And I think Rafael Nadal has a couple of academies now. We know he has one in Spain. I think he has another one in Cancun, Mexico. So what better than to have that type of tough coach in your face, hard-hitting type guy at your place that made you the champion that you are? With that said, though... Um, Carla, can you read uh, me the couple small statements that Tony Nadal stated in this article about how tough he was on Rafael Nadal? Sure, he's got like three of them. Um, and of course, it wasn't translated right, you know, because he speaks Spanish and usually things don't get translated right. If I talk about myself, a good thing I think was the requirement. Rafael was the boy who, from a very young age, demanded the same energy of the final of the European champion ship in training every day. I'm guessing that's the French Open, the yeah. European. I think it was more difficult for Rafael, Rafael to train with me than to play the European champion. The daily requirement is what I think that led him to develop his conditions to the maximum. Evidently, he's become number one thanks to his efforts, thanks to his talent, but also thanks to working with his great commitment every day. 
So the moral of the story here is, uh, I guess what he's trying to say is he may have been too tough on Rafael Nadal. I, I am going to call Hocus Pocus bullshit on that because he's got 19 majors, one away from, from Roger. Um, and he obviously didn't get to that position um, by someone patting him on the back all the time. Oh, you did so good. You did so good. Good shot. Good shot. Good shot. So great forehand. You did so good. I guarantee you that's not how you become a champion in anything, any walk of life. I don't care if it's painting or piano or guitar or drums or going to college or, or whatever your, your, your metaphor is here. I don't think, just the other day, Carla, you and I were going to one of our kids' tennis matches. Mm -hmm. I was pulling into the park and I saw uh, one of my professors from college. He was a soci uh, he, he taught modern sociological theory, by the way. Tough course. It was a senior year deal. So he's running, and he, used, he this was 20 years ago when I was in college, and he used to run the same route, and I was driving by, and lo and behold, there's, um, uh, da, 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 what's his last name? Gartman, know. Dr. Gartman. Jeez, I stopped him, Dr. Gartman, and I just forgot his name there for a second. But I, I saw a wonderful Dr. Gartman running the same trail he did 20 years ago, um, and, I, and I pulled up next to him, and I rolled down the window, and I was like, Dr. Gartman! And he's like, you know, looking all crazy or something. But then, you know, he comes over to the car and I'm like, man, it's good to see you. Um, so forth. you were my toughest teacher, at least for my minor sociology, and, and in the entire four-year run. It actually took five for me. But looking back on that, he was the toughest teacher. I had the hardest assignments. You could never get away from the books, ever. Seven days a week, you were on the books. But looking back upon that, I look back upon it and say, you know, this guy was one of the fundamental reasons why... Um, I was able to press so hard through that final year of my senior year. He kind of, with his toughness, um, on every now the half of the class failed, but you know those that actually pushed into it um, really had a good time as a group and as a whole. So my question to you, Carlin, to all of you, is this: How tough is too tough? Number one, and how do you, how do you, as a coach or as a parent, whether this is a metaphor for your children? whether you're a, a, a manager at work and you have employees or, or whatever the moral of the story is, how do you quantify or qualify what is too tough, number one? Um, how do you read your uh, students, your, 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 your players, your children? How do you read them to understand maybe how to coach them or to lead them and how to not coach and lead them. Um, what, what what do you look at, Carla? How tough is too tough, and how do you decipher? Uh, and, and, and how do you kind of uh, make sense of it? I think too tough, uh, there's quite a few factors. Too tough, if you're making uh, a student cry, then I think you went a little overboard, or maybe they're just sentimental. If you're beating them, throwing stuff at them, I've seen this happen before many times. I've seen parents, I've seen coaches uh, physically abuse the student, which is a bad thing. I think you went way overboard to try to prove your point. You know, there's a way of doing things. Now, what do you mean physically abuse? So you're, you're telling me you've been at courts? And, oh, yeah. And when I was a junior, yeah. I've watched, I played at Brooklyn Racquet Club. And Brooklyn makes some noise. That club no longer exists, but the person in charge there, um, he did train with professional players. He used to beat his daughter with anything that he had. And I saw him do the same thing with students. I mean, I had one guy that used to hit people with balls at another club. He hit one girl on the throat, on the throat. She went down. Hold up. Hold, oh hold up a second. Go there. How can I not? You just called someone out for hitting someone with the ball. No, no, no. There's a way of hitting somebody with a ball, but I remember she got hit right here, and she went down. She couldn't even breathe. Now, that's bad. That's what I'm talking I, about. I think that's probably an accident, though. No, he was just too much. He was a military guy. <laughs> he was just too much. Okay, well, well, wait a minute. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's times... Both of us, Carla, not just you, with our own children, obviously. We have, yep, we with have our five own of, children. We have five this of them. This wasn't that, his own child. Okay. Well, well let, let, let me define this because I don't want to make it sound like we're beating our kids or something. Look, man, That's my, not the case at all. My dad used to chase us with wooden rackets. Well, not me, my brother, because he would never run. He's And he would tell us, if I catch you, you're dead me. But he would never catch me. He'd catch my brother. <laughs> No, I, I think it was you, Carla, just the other day where Chris wasn't giving our son, our, our fourth oldest uh, son, Chris was, you know, they're not giving 100%. And you picked up your, you know, five or six shells of ammunition, meaning the, the balls, and I mean, just hit like heavy balls, no, he like won't. right at him. Like I think one of them hit him square in the back, oh, Carla. He, no, so that's nothing. Come on. He can handle it. He's a boy. 
Okay, but you... I was across the net. There's no way that ball hit you that hard. He's been hit with baseballs. Okay, while he was waiting to hit a base, he's been but, hit But harder. but but yeah, but when he got hit with baseballs, he was playing baseball and he oh, had a helmet on. And it was Peter like a foul. He wasn't listening. Come on. Look, okay, so okay, so just let's let's be let's 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 make. That's it. not beating your kids. I'm talking about where you beat them. You know, you constantly beating them and stuff. I've seen this, you know, down on their throat, just making them feel like they're this small. Look, I'm just calling a spade a spade. You were calling out someone for hitting them with a tennis ball, and you do the same on the thing. Throat? It's not well, even. Well, yeah, that's different. Don't throat hack them. That's kind of crazy. And, and obviously, we're not talking about other students. But yes, there are times when our five kids get out on the court and we're training them as a group, as a whole. And you can imagine that, you know, they bicker a lot. And yeah, we'll pick up a ball, and be like, boom, you know, but we don't like beat them with the ball but yes you can't call out someone for doing that when you do it yourself just saying clear mm-hmm. let's go let's get down let's go um a couple of things that i look at as a coach in in terms of trying to rationalize what is tough uh, and what may be too tough um are a lot of things number one levels i look at the levels of the player if if i see a player that that i'm getting to know or maybe just getting to know or maybe known them for a long time and I finally see the look in their eye change, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, you see a wild animal in the wild, you know, and you see a hunter, but you see a wild animal at the zoo and you kind of see a lap cat, right? You know, you get what I'm saying in a way. But if, if, I'm, if I'm training a student or getting to know a student um, or, or going through life with them in a way, and I see them say, go for a shot, hit the shot, make the shot, knowing they set it up, knowing they planned it, knowing they set up the point on their own and knowing they executed the point, and they turn around, you can get, you can see this look in their eye. You know, they're like a confident, like, you know. I'm not talking about, what, get down, what, like I do on the show. I don't do that on the court, by the way. I mean, I, occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, show emotion or whatever. You know, most of the time, though, I'm, 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 I'm pretty uh, steadfast and definitely don't grunt. True or not? True. I, I, I definitely don't make a scene on the court. Um, but when I see um, a, a student and I see that fighter in their eye and I know that they're Planning points. I know that they're putting them, to, putting them together, male or female, and I know they feel like beast mode when they do that. And I see it in their eye. Then I up the, then I up the coaching. Then I'm like, what? Let's go! Come on! Um, if, however, it's someone that I, I find is you know just kind of learning the game, maybe on the on the cusp of not playing it anymore, um, maybe on the cusp of not liking it in a way, and they're coming to us to maybe change that. I'm not going to get that proverbial kid or adult or senior or college player. Well, college player really wouldn't be in this. Maybe at the Division three level. But the Division one and uh, not in this conversation. They're fighting already. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, some of the Division three people, you know, that, that are soon to be that, that we deal with. You know, sometimes even there you're like, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to get in your face because I, I, don't, I don't know what you're going to do. You might cry on me or something. You but, just have to know your student. You have to know what type of student they are. Do they receive it well? Are they willing to fight? Do they want to fight? What, what are the reasons they're there? Some are not there to fight. Some are there just to play and some are there to become champions. Some of them are there to please uh, mom and dad and, and no disrespect to that. Thank goodness their, their, their loyal moms and dads have them out there on the court in the first place because, geez, where else would they be? Sitting at home, like stuck behind a television or something? Probably. So kudos to the mom and dad all the time uh, or every time for that because uh, what better place to be than in, in getting some fitness and, and meeting some friends and, and, and having a good time on the tennis court. However, a lot of those parents, though, and I won't say a lot, but a, a good percentage of them are more self-absorbed in the lessons. They're taking pictures of themselves or on their phones the whole time, not really giving a crap of what's going on on the court, at least for the most part. Not, or, or not for the most part. For the most part, uh, you don't get that. But you do get that, and you wonder your, to yourself, you know, why they're really there in the first place. You know, what's the goal here? Um, so I, I do, I do, uh, I am really, really honest about this. Um, when we coach, I don't, I don't find it, Carlo, that we go out and coach as a way of, um, you know, putting uh, more money in our pockets. Or I, I know we coach as a business, but I, I think we coach and have people that come to us because we know we're going to be tough. We know we're going to be a hard ass. We know they know we're going to be in their face. I, I know a lot of places around here. Um, what? Start at okay, thanks. No worries. So I, I know, I know, I know a lot of uh, local clubs, and, and I mean, there's probably three or four of them um, around here. By the way, thanks to my son. A little, yeah, a, we had a, a, we had quite yeah. a few times we had to record. We this we, show. we recorded this show, and it was a good one for like. 
35 minutes. And, it took and then Carla off. goes around to turn off the camera and it never even, it was it was off and didn't record anything. Yeah. So please don't think this and is And we some, tried to do it live. Some of you guys saw us. We tried to do it on live, but our connection sucks. <laughs> um, so it, 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 please don't think this is some elaborate setup. This is a corner of my streaming room and all the furniture is like backed up this way. And that's a tripod that the phone sits on that B-Dog 02 out there. What's up, B-Dog 02? Um, saw a link we had in our description field last year, like donate, whatever, and he did that, and mm -hmm. we bought the tripod with it. But other than that, that's what we put into it, um, aside from meeting you guys. So what you see is what we get, so we do our best. Um, so hopefully this comes across better, or as good the, this time as it did the first time. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, a lot of the local places around here, um, or all of them, let's just say, at least on uh, where we are here, um, you, you'll spend 50 bucks for your kid to go take a lesson for an hour, and the only thing the coach is doing, tapping balls over the net, not saying anything. Half the time they're picking up their own balls, um, and, and, and you know, an, an hour later, yes, but 30 minutes after hitting, maybe, picking up balls the other 30 minutes, the kid hasn't even broke a sweat yet. They don't even know what's going on, and they haven't done anything, and then they're off, and you know, the, the kid walks out to the parent's car, and off they go. Some of the clubs here, you can't even walk into unless you roll in a Bentley or a Porsche or a Range Rover or something, and then it costs like ten grand a month to stay there uh, as a member. But the coach there is rolling down eighty bucks an hour, and and it just is antiquated. It's like going to take a lesson from Rod Laver now. Not that I wouldn't want to have a lesson from Rod Laver, but I think it would be more ceremonial. Like I don't think you know um, the, the Rod Laver is going to teach the the aggressive in your face coaching right now. I didn't mean that disrespect to Laver. I just no, meant, I get what you're saying. You see it's what I'm saying? It's like. Like, I'm, I'm going yeah, to take okay. a lesson from Grandpa. No disrespect to Grandpa. My father's 82 and still plays, but he's not going to teach me anything new on the court except maybe tactics and patience and humility and all that stuff. But I'm just saying. So I think a lot of parents bring their kids to us for the, the fact that they know they're going to be um, driven. They're going to be worse. They're going to be. Um, it, they're going to be driven hard. Put it that way. Yes. I mean, again, it, you know which kids to push. You know which ones not to push. The true champions. You know, like you said, Nadal. He had to be pushed hard. Thanks to his uncle, he is where he is. Right. Yeah. No. Speaking about um, coaches, etc. I do have a question for all the Serbian viewers out there. This question is for all the Serbian viewers, respectively. Let's go, soldiers out there. Always have been. Um, again, we've made reference to the likes of uh, Helena Yankovic, uh, Anna Ivanovic, uh, Novak Djokovic, that took practice in bombed out swimming pools while stealth bombers are flying overhead. I don't need to get into that, but it's fact. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, going back to the CS thing, I told my kids. CS is, is what's going on in the world that we I, can't say here because told, our videos get taken I told down. my kids if Novak Yankovic and uh, Ivanovic can all train while they were at war and. They tra they train in indoor what what do you call it? underground pools? They can train. Well, while well, this is well. During, during from, from what I understand historically, and and in, you all in Serbia again, much love. Uh, they hold down a large portion of the show. Um, but when 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 you have aircraft flying over your house with precision guided munitions, meaning bombs and tomahawk cruise missiles. You don't want to stay, like, at, at sea level. You want to, like, get down. Right. Like, what I say, get down, but not funny because that's real. Um, you want to get down. Well, you have to stay fresh when you're playing tennis. We know that. Well, we got to get down somewhere so, you know, the roof doesn't necessarily fall on our head. And if it does, we're kind of below so we can still maybe breathe if the roof does fall on our head. Mm -hmm. um, but if, 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 if these players can take practice in, in these types of situations. I think you said it perfectly the other day with this going on in the world, and we know it, CS. Um, if with it going on in the world, we understand that, um, that there will be perils and, and there will be losses and etc. cetera, but um, life must go on. And, 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 and I think that um, the Serbians, especially in their tennis game, have epitomized that over wars for centuries at the, you know, and countries splitting and so forth. But my question to the Serbians is this. Is um, Marian Vajda a tough coach? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I would pay him to teach my kids if I had the money. I Absolutely. Have, I, have, I have always been super fond of this guy. Not that I've ever met him or ever even been around him. I have been at the U.S. Open a couple years and been near Djokovic. Never met. Just, you know, walking by type thing. And um, But this guy, Vajda, always, to me, demands respect. When, when, when I have seen him, I've never met, but just in his presence or seen him on television... 
It looks like the man demands respect. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Now, is being um, a demanding, in-your-face, hard-hitting coach imperative for developing a champion? <laughs> what? Nothing. Yes, definitely. Obviously, any champion, you can ask uh, Federer, you can ask Nadal, you can ask Djokovic, Serena, Steffi Graf, Boris Becker, Borg, McEnroe, they all had to deal with a tough coach in order to get to where they're at. All of them. They all had to cry. They all had to sweat. They all had to not sleep. I mean, yeah, definitely. You need to be tough. So you don't think it's a good recipe for success to have your student be able to hit just the forehand and go, oh, good, good shot? No, no, no. You're doing really well. Because we all know that tennis is mental, right? I mean, you could be down 5-1, oh. you could be down five one, and some people know how to figure it out, and that's what makes a champion. They don't break down. They figure it out. So you have to be able to handle someone pounding you and pounding you. It's almost like the military. They pound you. The Navy SEALs, they pound these guys until they can finally get through. I mean, these guys don't sleep. They don't eat. They're constantly, you know, being yelled at. And look, that's why they're tough. Because it prepares them It prepares them for when the shit hits the fan. Right. Period. You can't go and, 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 and be so nice all the time to your student. Now, I, I do see coaches, and man, I can't tell you the list is, is, is never-ending about coaches that I've met over the years. And they're all about themselves. They're all about hearing themselves talk. They're all they're all about fitting in with the parents. They're all about having the same cars and, and, and going to the same clubs and all this stuff. Meanwhile, the poor kid that wants to learn is just you know fodder in the background. It's just like a pawn for their egotistical escapades. It just is, and I see it every day. So the last thing I'm ever gonna do is have some child roll out to my spot and not get in their face. And I'm sorry, but today we were teaching a seven-year-old, and I got in her face a bit. Did I not? Yeah, but she did great. And she did great. Love, love her. Great. But I don't care if you're seven, if you're five, if you're four. If you're out on the court, it's business. Let's roll. I tell every student that I teach, every damn student, I don't care if it's my kids or someone else's student, when you come to that fence and you shut the gate and you walk on this court, it's business. I don't care if mommy and daddy are right behind me in the fence. I'm going to tell you what's up. Have I, have I ever gotten into it with a couple of parents, Carla? Yes, definitely. I've had one dude, like, wanting to kill me. Um, anyway, I won't go there. I'm just saying I've had dudes literally want to kill me because I'm, like, in, the, in their daughter or whatever's face. Like, come on, we can do better than that. But ultimately, they, they realize that um, we want to build and, and we want to have good players. She's looking at me like, that's crazy, but it's the truth. And I speak the truth. I'm not going to hide behind the truth. I don't have any disrespect for anybody. I'm just saying... I'm not going to not be myself because I'm worried about who's giving me a, a $30 at the end of the hour, man. But that's not even why we coach. We, we do seven other things. We coach because we have passion for it and we want to share our passion with the game or of the game with others before we leave this planet. And based upon the CS, it might be next week. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, but I, I will always be myself on the court. And if you come to my court and I'm coaching you, Come to the fence, shut the gate, you don't give me effort, you're running. If you don't hit balls, and I know you can hit balls and, 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 and capitalize on your opportunities, I'm going to get in your face. And, and if you, and if parents, you don't like it, then just ask for her all the time and don't let me come out there because I'm going to get... Ask for me? Wait a minute. Wait she, a minute. She's nicer. She's wait, nicer. No, 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 She'll no. get into talking. The, and, yeah. I don't do all the talking stuff. Wait, there's female, I don't do talking. There's female students that prefer you because they say I'm too tough. So don't even go there. Okay, well, that's fine. But you may there must talk, be some weak females. You might talk, you may talk a lot and you might bark, but when it's time for us to drill and hit, I'm tougher. I disagree with that. Ask any student. I, I disagree with that. I, I totally disagree with no. that. May, maybe across some that you that you know that there's some that don't like me. I know that. Yeah, there's you know I think we're we're tit for tat on that. We have some that like and some that don't. Uh, but ultimately, the goal is is we're, we we really try to be the tough coach like the Vige, At least I, I I'm thinking he is, but like Tony Nadal, because you can't raise a champion unless you're tough. I'm sorry, you may hit. Yeah, you like I said, every student is different. What are you there for? If the purpose for you is to get better and be at the highest level, then we're gonna go hard. But if you're just there for just to be there, then it's different. I'm not gonna chew them up. I'm not going to yell at them. But we will still proceed oh, to, to them show up. them and to develop yes. them and grips and strategy and serve. Definitely. How many students do we have, Carla, that come to us that parents have been paying $80 an hour to three times a week for five years? They come out to us and they can't even serve still. The only thing they can do is hit a forehand. How many? Yeah. A, a multitude? Yeah. And then they come here uh, they, 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 and then we work on the serve and they're hitting serves in three weeks. Mm -hmm. 
Because so many coaches, they don't want to deal with it. They just want to mingle with the, the parents and talk about their new Benzes and BMWs and Range Rovers and not give a shit about the kid as long as they're hitting a forehand. Hence one of the reasons what's wrong with American tennis. Anyway, ending the show with this topic. In tennis, we have the proverbial medical timeout, right? We have the proverb, proverb, proverbial medical timeout. You know, you can, have a, you can be winning a match, you know, 6-0, 4-0, and then your opponent can say, oh, my leg hurts. Oh, 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 I just, oh, I need a trainer. I need a trainer. Not my back. Oh, oh I, just, my, I just ripped the muscle. <laughs> and, and then the match stops, and what can, what can happen is the person that was on fire can cool down. Um, it can allow it, it can allow it can allow <laughs> some deceit into the match. Uh, it can piss the person off that um, th- that was on the roll. By the way, so so if I'm in a match and I'm destroying someone and they call a medical timeout, um, it happened to our son not too terribly long ago. Fifteen call, minute cramp timeout. Fi- well, it, yeah, but, it, but if there would have been, a, he was just sitting on there. Well, you can't do it for a cramp, but this kid did because the ref wasn't around. No, well, we asked the coach, but he just let us slide. So. Yeah, you're like whatever. So much cheesiness in American tennis, man. And then this this was actually a tournament. And then no, it, this was like a semifinal. My, no, this was a tournament. It was a regular tournament. It was the second. It round. was across the bay. It was first round, actually. First round, I remember it. He lost the match. He was up huge on this kid. He gets a cramp, sits down in the middle of the court. Minutes, talking 15, to his friend. Fifteen minutes talking to his friend on his phone and everything until his cramp went no, away. No, his friend showed up, sat with him. Not ever. Anyway, so let's get to the point. Anyway, the, the moral of the story here is. Is, is here we are with this thing that's going around, the CS. Um, and the ATP Tour has been timed out. I know the, the, the WTA has canceled a couple of things, but still haven't made their mind up moving forward. But here is this timeout on the entire tour. Okay, What players does this really help? What players does it not help at all? Um, and does it matter to anyone? I'm going to go ahead and tell you my thoughts. I think that absolutely this timeout helps... Uh, Bianca Andreescu. I think that this timeout really helps Serena Williams. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to get into this thing about Serena Williams, about her spending six weeks in solitude um, with this coronavirus. I, I, I don't want to gripe about you this. You just said it. <laughs> uh, well, well, look. Serena Williams, uh, again, um, she's a, the greatest women's player of all time. I get it. But in the latter part of her career, it's just... oh, Some of the stuff that she just says and does is just so crazy. Let me shove this ball down your throat and retiring in matches and crying and all this hunching over like Monfils stuff. I, I, I don't want to go there, but for her to make a statement during this hard time that I'm going to take six weeks in solitude is shit to me. Who in their right mind that watches you um, can afford to do that? How many people wish they could, but they can't? How many people, Carla? This was a shit comment. It should be erased. Uh, and this is just another strike in the overall historical diary of Serena Williams in the latter part of a career looking back. I understand that you're... You forget she's Serena. She's well, a, she's a diva. And she's and, a and, mom and, and, and a wife. You're a mom. You're a wife. you got five kids. she got I'm one. Playing. She's got a billionaire husband. you got a husband that's so broke he can't even pay attention. So all I'm saying is I don't need to read a freaking comment about you're going to spend six weeks in solitude. Why don't you say something more humbly about... Um, be safe, everyone, and just leave it at that. But if you're going to tell the globe that you're going to spend six weeks in she solitude... She just wanted to, you guys to know that she's going to be alone. Well, boo freaking who? You're going to spend six weeks with your billionaire boyfriend or husband or whatever and your daughter? That's great. But we don't need to hear about it because all of us are still grinding and struggling and hoping we don't get sick when we got to go out there and work. So I'm glad you're sucking it up in six weeks of solitude. Jeez, Who cares? Go teach a lesson like some of these other players that have to do it to survive while you're spending six weeks in Grand Bahama in solitude with your boy. Come on, man. Spare us. Learn how to be a global icon and stop being a diva. Anyway, who does this help? Who does it not help? I get pissed about that. Everybody out here is struggling. Can't even get shit paper at the toilet store. At the whatever store. I gotta listen. I'm gonna spend six weeks in solitude. Here's a selfie with me. Shut up! Got five children. Got a wife. Got whatever, man. Give me some shit paper. Done. Shit. Anyway, I'm out. That's it. Let's go. I hate that, man. Everybody's struggling out it? here. Everybody's struggling out here. Oh, yeah. You gotta see. I'm gonna spend six weeks oh in solitude. God, he's still going about this. Jeez. Take care. Much love to everyone. Let's go. Boom.